welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob, it's me, Jackie, from my house today. Hey, it's me, Diana. Oh boy, everybody. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling pretty happy. Perhaps I would even say joyful. How about you? I'm always joyful. That's true. Actually, that's true, Jackie. It's a stupid question to ask you. The answer is, of course. (laughs) Joyful McDonald's. And why might why might I be feeling that way? You ask, listener, as you tuned in to our latest episode where we talk about behavior analysis and behavior analytic literature, and say what could be the topic today. Well, I, I've 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 cued you in. You've you've probably guessed it. We're going to be talking about joy, certainly is one of our topics, and more specifically as it relates to its place in behavior analysis and its relation to how we can look at functional analyses and preventative treatment planning and how all of that together can be a part of and bring joy. And I don't know about you all, but I couldn't think of anyone I'd rather have on to talk about this topic than someone who has multiple presentations and books that use joy and all of these happy, you know, beautiful terms. Dr. Shala Alai Rosales, who is here with us. Thank you, Shala, for coming on to the program today. Well, thank you for having me. And I have to say, if you could all see me, I'm smiling because I feel joyful just listening to you make the introduction. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. That's what they pay me the big bucks for, my intro (laughs) intro skills. (laughs) So, Shala, we have you tonight, and we are very excited to talk about certainly a recent paper. You have a great talk that we were able to, you know, you shared with us from online. I know there's also a book that if people want to get even more that you were just mentioning to us coming out. So we've got a lot of things to go over. But before we get into any of those things, let's start with, if you don't mind, a little introduction about yourself, how you got into ABA, and specifically this area of research. Sure. Well, my journey started many, many years ago. When I was 16, I started volunteering in a Head Start program. And I didn't know it at the time, but it was a program that incorporated a lot of behavioral approaches. And I've always really liked working with young children and families. And part of the Head Start programs, part of their platform is that you also work with the whole family, the child in the system. And then I went to undergraduate school at Southern Illinois University, and I was in child and family studies, and I had no idea that that was one of the meccas of behavior analysis at the time. This was in the late 70s, early 80s, and there was a lot going on there. But luckily, I came into contact with two people who later became my mentors, John and Sandra Lutzker, as well as other behavior analysts. And the first pro sem I went to as an undergraduate was Don Bear, and I had no idea who he was or anything. But I remember (laughs) thinking, wow, I really like this. And then I started working with the Head Start at Southern Illinois, and they had a combined program with the behavior analysis program where they worked with families who had been suspected or convicted of abuse or neglect. And that's how I started learning a lot about the power and importance of a science to help, in my case, to help children and families live better lives. It was also the time, around those times, that I read Walden Chu. And I really loved the idea of communities that were that were designed and arranged for well-being and included everybody, especially at that time, Walden too, which I'm sure you've all read, but if you haven't, you should, especially uh, things around gender and things around work-life balance and children, like some of those things were dealt with in really interesting ways. But the central, the central point of it all was experiment and try to study yourselves and your communities and understand how you could make things better. So anyway, I'll fast forward. Everyone at SAU said go to KU because that was the absolute mecca for if you wanted to work with young children, that was the place to go. So I went to KU and I got my degree in developmental and child psychology with an emphasis in behavior analysis. Well, I got two degrees, but I got all my training there. And then I was working with typically developing kids in the labs, started working with 
children with autism in the mid 80s. It was just when like Lovas's data was coming out. And as we were going along, Catherine Maurice published her book and Mm -hmm. that produced a really big set of opportunities for developing services for children with autism and their families. So, and after that, I had not graduated when we came to UNT. I was still finishing my dissertation, but once I finished, then I joined the faculty at UNT and have been here for, I think, like over 26 years now. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And as you know, we have a a department of behavior analysis, which is a little bit different than some other places. And we have many faculty and students who are doing a wide variety of things. And that has been really good because I think that having, it's it's like massive multiple exemplar training over time. Right? <laughs> so so it's, it's seeing how the science <clears throat> and the practice play out, but also how, what the issues are, how you work through the intricacies of human behavior change, which is actually quite complicated. (laughs) So especially, especially the ethics and the, the inclusivity of it, I think is a, is a, is kind of one of the things our field is working with right now. One of our areas of big growth. So (laughs) That's so true. For sure. So we've got a couple things that we'll be sort of focusing our conversation on tonight. Diana, would you would you do the honors? And I've known these articles too, just a little peek behind the curtain to to our listeners, because at some point someone was eating a barbecue chicken pizza while reading this article. Yeah. And there's a little bit of it still on the corner of the article. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yes. Someone. It's a, uh, I think this is a, a someone is you. Ma'am. Oh, is this the one? <laughs> this might be oh, the one, yes. I, it's a lived-in article. We have a lot sure. of articles around the house. <laughs> I, love that it's li- I love that it's lived in. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> All right, so it's kind of exciting tonight because we have a multimedia approach here as far as the materials that we're going to review for today. So first up, we have a journal article that will be one of our main topics of discussion, and it's titled The Big Four. Functional Assessment Research Informs Preventative Behavior Analysis, and that's by Alai Rosales, Sihon, Courier, Ferguson, Leaf, Leaf, McKechn, and Weinkoff, published in Behavior Analysis and Practice 2019. And then we also have a document that summarizes a talk that Dr. Alai Rosales has given And the version we have, I believe, was given at the Oklahoma Autism Conference, but I've seen a different version of this talk as well, and it's titled Nurturing Contingencies of Joy. So we're going to thread that in as well. And then in addition to the article and the PowerPoint presentation, we also now have a brand new book that is just out and available for folks if they end up wanting to learn and read more about this topic. And it's titled Responsible and Responsive Parenting in Autism Between Now and Dreams. And that is by Dr. Eli Rosales and also Peggy Heinkel Wolf. And it's published from Different Roads to Learning, which is a great publication source. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. I must say, Shaw, the, the talk or the PowerPoint, I wish I'd been there because those are some of the most beautiful <laughs> slides I have ever seen. I'm like, I spent most of my note taking time being like, my PowerPoints look like garbage. Like where, what was the template? These are amazing. Like flowers, the quotes and like the font usage. Really so thing. good. Yeah. Like it captures mm-hmm. the topic so well. I, I actually have to tell you something, especially about that talk. So I created it during the pandemic. And I don't know if you know, but doing webinars during the pandemic is like one of the most painful things in the world. Because you're you're in the middle of a pandemic, but you're also not talking to anybody. And so my whole jam is be responsive. And it's really hard to be responsive if there's nobody there. So, So So I actually, I use Unsplash, which is a free website that also for pictures, but it's also inclusive and representative of many people in many different ways of living. So Mm -hmm. I love that anyway, but I found myself populating my PowerPoints more and more with happy children and families (laughs) because it would get me to feel happy while I was presenting. Like, like I think those visual SDs and aesthetics 
are also part of what bring us joy in, in life. So thank you for noticing that. Okay, it, of course. It, it, it became very important to me more than usual. Thanks. <laughs> oh, not a problem. Not a problem. Thank you for, thank you for making it. Uh, so, I mean, Shala, I, I have to be honest. There's, there's sort of two ways that I was thinking or that we sort of had talked about in terms of the questions and how do we wanted to do this discussion and this interview and the, and, and the review of the articles. On the one hand, I think is that practical component of like, let's talk about preventative care and let's talk about how the functional analysis has benefited and not benefited us, which I secretly assume all of our listeners are like me and they're just want to, they don't want to talk about feelings and emotions and they're very grumpy and they just want some facts to take to their, to their work while they're, you know, after they're done listening. But a part of me wants to go into uh, outside of my comfort zone and actually start by talking about what you mean and, and what your definition of when you're talking about joy and how that joyfulness is a component of those those big four components that you talk about in the article. So I leave it up to you. I, I would assume you probably want to start with joy because that might be more fun. But again, we can also get really just very boring and dry and not mention emotion at all if you really want I think you're to. You're leading your witness. I'm leading my witness. <laughs> I'm not very leadable, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> but but also the other thing is, is I think it's become so much part of how I'm looking at things as a behavior analyst. So it's, it's kind of hard for me not to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So I'll do both things, I guess. Okay. But first, I, I probably should give a little summary of the big four for people who haven't read it. So the basic premise of it is we have over 60 years of this just really important research looking at when people are having difficulty, when they're suffering or people around them are suffering or both, everyone's suffering. We have six, over 60 years of research that, help us, that helps us understand that behavior just isn't the topography. It's not just what it looks like or how it feels even, but that the function of it is really important. And, and our field has developed methodologies, you know, in, in much gratitude to Carr, the the original, the early Carr, and then <laughs> Carr Duran, and then Brian Iowata and all of his students' work over time. But in fact, I believe that work probably would deserve a Nobel Prize if we would give one for things like this, because it's a really important concept. Mm -hmm. And I think that we will continue to need the methodology because it's kind of like malaria. You know, malaria persists and we still need treatments for malaria, but we also know a lot about preventing it and the conditions that prevent it. So the idea is that we're at the point, I think, where we know a lot about the conditions that produce suffering and difficulty for people. And there's kind of four of them, <laughs> at least, you know, there's variations, but, but even for all of us, whether you have what's labeled a disability or not, you know, if you cannot communicate what you want or what you don't want effectively and the environment doesn't respond to your communications, there's, there's going to be difficulty and frustration. If you can't gain the attention, the affection, care from other beings, there'll be difficulties. If you can't find things to do that you can do alone or with other people without hurting yourself or other people, there are going to be difficulties. And if you can't kind of know how to grind, know how to get through situations that are, that are hard, but they may be good for you in the long run, then you're going to have difficulties because you may not develop skills. Like even for example, I'm actually not that fond of giving talks, <laughs> nor am I that fond of like being watched, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I do go ahead and do it because number one, I'm hoping that it will help other people. And number two, I almost always learn something in the process that helps me do what I do better. So I go ahead and develop my skills in that area. And I, you know, keep doing it. So anyway, so the big four is this idea. Well, if we know about those, those conditions and not just the behaviors, but, but the, what sets the occasion for them, what maintains them, what the alternatives are. If we know about that, we can look towards more prevention for, for all beings. Turns out it's, it's good for almost every living organism to, to know those things or, or to have some way to operate under those four conditions. So the idea is, 
is at least especially in our article really focuses on people with disabilities that maybe we have an obligation from the very beginning to address those conditions. And maybe the obligation isn't just to address the big four, but it's to move beyond just stopping someone from being a pain to everybody else <laughs> or or to themselves. It's it should be more than that. We should be right. we should be looking at at improving quality of life and that we should be working towards contingencies that that are something more than everybody just stopping you being a problem. And then that's where it leads to joy. I, I love the way that you summarize that. And I think that that's so important and meaningful. What you're saying is you know, there's so much to, to gain out of life, right? And, and so many ways that we want to be able to express ourselves and experience what life has to offer. And that's true no matter who you are. Mm-hmm. And the piece that I'm I'm hearing here from you is we're not just, we don't want to just be responsive in those situations, right? But we want to teach people how to expand beyond their current situation to be able to access those additional things that they want and need. And that's not just in like those four little areas, right? Like that's, that's the starter and they expand into so many more complex yeah. responses and, and meaningful ways to interact. And not only for the person, but for the people around that person, that it's, it's also to help them move beyond just seeing the person as a problem right. and, mm-hmm. and to help both the person and the people around them have better relationships. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that, that was one of the things that, in fact, when we were going through the peer review process with the article, there was at least one reviewer that was very uncomfortable with my use of the word joy in the article, but it was so good because that really pressed us to explain why it was important to keep it in there. And actually, I sometimes I don't like what I wrote, but I really like that paragraph about joy <laughs> because it explains that we want to move beyond someone being a problem to other people, that we want words that describe contingencies that signal mutual reinforcement, mm-hmm. approach, ascent, pleasure. Like we wanted, we wanted to use words that signal something more. And those are the words we use. In fact, one of the first studies in behavior analysis, I don't know if you know the study about Dickey that was published in 1964, but from the first day I read that in the 80s, I guess, early 80s, what was impressed on me was, yes, he made phenomenal change, but that last paragraph where they say his family found joy. Like, they used the word joy in 1964. It's not a new thing to us to talk about important feelings. So, Charlotte, when, when you talk about joy or when others talk about joy, I mean, is is it really just kind of the, the shorthand for everything you just described in terms of, you know, <clears throat> Indicators of happiness, approach, uh, <laughs> you know, approach to activity, engagement. Is it more than that? I mean, how do you think about that? I think about it in complicated ways. <laughs> I, I don't think it's all those things. I think it's probably, and for each of us, it may vary, you know, to some degree. But I think it's particular types of contingencies and feelings. Like I think Gold Diamond and of course some of the people who have been scholars and worked with Gold Diamond, like Joe Lang, Paul Andranis, Jesus Rosales, I think they've all talked about how emotions are flags for contingencies. And I think emotions in themselves are goals. And I and I also think that they flag contingencies. So I think joy is a particular set of things. And I think that's something to continue unpacking. I also think there are other things though, like focus <laughs> or magnanimity. You know, there are there are all kinds of things that humans that we talk about and those very specific words, I think tact very specific contingencies and context. So when we talk about joy, and I talk about this in the talk and and we talk about it in the book a little bit, you know, there's something about joy that usually means it's something that it's shared. And it's also something that feels sort of sublime in some way, that it's, it's a very special feeling. And it's more than just happiness. It's a shared thing. It's also something 
that when we look at how people use that word, it's something that feels a little detached from the immediate ongoing things, which to me, I I don't exactly know how to think about that, but it means that there are wide bands of reciprocity about Mm -hmm. who we are and how we're accepted and a space to be happy within a very, maybe from a behavioral lens, we would talk about it where there are a lot of degrees of freedom, that it's a very free operant (laughs) and there's not a lot of restrictions on us. I don't know. You know, I think it's something for us to think about when we use certain words, what are we talking about? And I think, I think there are words like that, that we're talking about very specific ways and conditions. I know in one of the, one of the slides, in in your talk, you sort of have, you know, joy and then like lots of different phrases or, or words that that kind of relate to it. And I know the one that jumped out at me was joy as act of liberation. And you kind, you kind of mentioned it's sort of like, you know, the joy being kind of a free opera. But I, I sort of more think of it, I think, in line with the idea of prevention, that idea of uh, we can start from the beginning teaching these skills, preparing our children to engage in these skills. And and that feels more freeing in a way than yeah. there's a problem. We got to solve this problem because right. as long as this problem's in place, the individual won't be able to, you know, access less restrictive environments. I love that because you kind of put two things together. I hadn't been putting together in that way. First of all, I love that quote. It's Nicholas O'Rourke and he does. He, he is an activist from Chicago and he talks about joy as an act of resistance. When things are so horrible, we can choose to be joyful. Mm-hmm. And I think that I love putting it in terms of the prevention, that particular way of looking at joy, because I think that but it also means it's like an intentional choice. We're going to find a way to not be in this, in this system, in this bad set of circumstances, and we're going to resist it and find something better, find something that is healthier for all of us. And I think, you know, a lot of what happened with the uprising and the pandemic and all of that was about that. And I think that for people with disabilities, who are in situations where their lives are restricted and they're suffering and the people around them are suffering. I love the idea of prevention as an act of resistance. I think that's really beautiful. Thank you. I love that too. Sure. You put it together because I often think about it, you know, because I work with parents and, and mostly toddlers or young kids with autism. I usually think about it in terms of like, like I always show this um, YouTube where it's, uh, you guys have probably seen it. It's the dad and the little boy and they're having like this awesome conversation. Yes. I cried. I remember sitting in the audience, Diana and I saw your talk at Thompson center and you showed it. And I was like, I was like yeah. looking around and like, nobody watch <laughs> me cry at a conference. Cause it was so sweet. Yeah. Was so cute. In fact, sometimes when I just want to lift, I'll watch that video and there are a couple (laughs) other ones that are just, they're just beautiful humans communing and not Mm -hmm. like in, in the clip, you know, the dad's using language, you know, conventional language, but the the baby's just kind of like babbling and making facial expressions and pointing and, but they're doing it so together. And they're also so together with the mom who's behind the camera. Mm -hmm. It's just like a beautiful interaction. So I always think of that mutual enjoyment and I, I was in the talk, I started looking at how different people talk about joy, but the one I've always focused on in that, but I think I had the quote by O'Rourke and I didn't really pull it together the way you just did. And I, I like thinking about it that way too. Feel free, feel free to use it as much as you like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, and also O'Rourke is incredible. Like the activist, the activism you know, what they've accomplished in Chicago has been really good. Nice. Oh, I, I always find it amazing when, when folks can find these like great quotes from people I, I've either never heard of, or then I want to go look up afterwards, like a good quote. I it's, it's, it, it does. So it does so much. Does like bring just, you joy. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I okay. think it does, Diana. Thank you. <laughs> well, quotes are, are great ways of tacting something quite specific that yeah. you might be experiencing that someone else has also experienced. So mm-hmm. I also love quotes, but I love this idea of what we're talking about, this freeing component of joy. And when I have done clinical work in the past, I've had families who said to me like, well, you know, oh, we're going on, you know, it's vacation week, right? Or it's the weekend. Like, what do you want us to go work on? 
And I say, I don't want you to go work on anything. I want you to go home and enjoy your child and just have time with them, right? And establish that relationship with them. And like having them see me say that and seeing their response to it, it like totally changes everything about the dynamic between us and the dynamic between them and their child. And that for me was freeing on my side and freeing to be able to tell them that, like, I don't want you to go work on things, right? Like it should be about the two of you enjoying, like you're their parent, right? And they're your child and nothing's ever going to change that. And that's what you have to find the joy, right? That kind of makes me think of something else that I think is really important that I think sometimes we look at like joy or compassion as a way of showing that what we're doing or getting what we want, getting people to do what we want. If we're compassionate, then we'll get them to have buy-in or something like that, you know, but that I think what you're saying makes me also think, you know what, and I believe this firmly, but the family's happiness is a really important goal. Like that in itself is a goal. It doesn't have to be, although teaching episodes are great and, you know, skill acquisition is great, but I think happiness is a goal. It's something to learn how to measure, to learn how to monitor and to learn how to facilitate and support. I think actually, I know this is about the articles that I wrote, but I want to like give a shout out to Eileen Schwartz. I don't know if you've seen it, but she just wrote an article on quality of life as the main dependent measure for behavior Mm -hmm. analysts. And I think that, you know, I've been thinking about that a lot lately in relationship to our work. And I think that, I think it's important to really zero in and pick a few goals and get those and make progress. But I think we have to have the ability to zoom in and out and to see those small goals that we're working on, but also to see how they're fitting in the big picture of a child and a family's life over time. And that in the end, I think most of us would say the most important things in our life are about, you know, our feelings as we went through life and and our relationships with other people. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass. to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Master's of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Master's of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master's certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. Regiscollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. Sorry, everybody. Just got to put our conversation on pause for one second to remind all of our listeners that ABA Inside Track is ACE approved. By listening to our show, you are able to earn one learning credit. All you need to do is finish listening to the show, of course, and then go to our website, abainsidetrack.com. We have so many episodes at this point that we've sort of had to break the CEs into get CEUs and more CEUs. So this is more CEUs, but you know, this episode, because because we've gotten into the more stage, I should say. I'm sure you, you care very much about the nitty gritty of website design. In any case, you can also go to the link in the show notes that'll be on your podcast player or on the website to go directly to to the page where you can purchase CEs. You are going to need, no matter where you go, and no matter how you get there, you are going to need two secret code words. Uh, I've got the first of those right here, and these are our secret guest code words from Dr. Ali Rosales. And the first one is community, C-O-M-M-U-N-I-T-Y, community, which refers to a lot of things, one of which is the community of practice that we all hope to be in to continue our work in preventative 
treatment as well as our you know, kind of you know thought processes behind things like how do we add joy to these interactions, uh, as well as the community that we would like all of our children to grow up and be nurtured in. I suppose if you want to, we could even refer to the short-lived but highly influential NBC sitcom Community. Whichever one of those you like, probably the first two, but you know, check out the third one if you got time. Community. And now back to our discussion about joy and the big four with Dr. Shala Ali Rosales. So Shala, when we look at the at the, it's sort of the big four that you you know put forth in in the paper, you know, reading the paper and sort of thinking about them and thinking about, you know, preventative treatment or I don't know if it's treatment if it's preventative, but <laughs> that that engagement on the one hand it feels like, "Oh, okay, we're talking about the main functions of problem behavior. We're talking about teaching alternatives to those main functions as early as possible." That seems kind of, you know, straightforward or so, but I think the other the other piece is, well, if it were so easy, everyone would just kind of naturally do it without thinking about it, and no one would publish papers on it. Where do you find that you know idea of prevention or maybe even the practice of those steps being something that might not be a natural occurrence? Or, or where are the barriers to you know prevention just sort of being what we naturally do as caregivers or as clinicians? Yeah, I actually think that's a more complicated thing than it seems. <laughs> I think that, first of all, it's not teaching alternative behaviors. Like, we think about it that way. So the first thing is, no, these are just good things. Like, you know that old that old saying, you know, I learned everything I needed to know in kindergarten? I, I think it's actually kind of like, those are like the fundamentals in that, whatever it was, the, the poster, the, mm-hmm. the poem. I think it's sort of like that, that maybe we should think about it as, I learned everything I need to know in early intervention. <laughs> And, and the big four were kind of it. But I think it's also, it's important to know it's not just the children learning, that mm-hmm. it's also the immediate learning environment, the family environment, and the community. It's, it's a joint project. So it's working on those skills, but it's also having an environment that is responsive to those skills and helps the skills develop over time. And that, I think, makes it get a little bit more complicated. I, I also think that Part of what influenced this paper, I think, and actually it was it was sort of written, I think, in like 1993 or something. <laughs> it was one of my comps for graduate school, and it wasn't until later, and I think it was Justin Leaf and John McCack who said, you know, this is a good idea, and we started talking about it more. But I wrote it right after the Iowata Big Analysis came out, and I was an early childhood educator, and I thought, why aren't we just working on these things before it's mm-hmm. a problem? And... My father was in public health, so my whole growing up was hearing about prevention, which is public health is the branch of medicine that stops things before they become a problem. So, But I think public health has a lot of struggles because it means doing something before there's an aversive stimulus. And I think that as humans, part of our evolution must be we have to learn not to do that, mm-hmm. <laughs> not, not to wait until there's a right. burst of stimulus, not to wait until someone's health crashes to have a response, not to wait till a kid, you know, puts his head through a window to have a response that, which is also part of seeing dignity as a goal in itself, compassion as a way in itself. Like those are all constructional proactive things. But they're harder because there is no aversive stimulus telling us learn this. So although there's a big one going on is we'll destroy ourselves if we don't get better generally about constructing rather than destructing in our world. Mm -hmm. I I don't know. Those are just some of my thoughts. And, you know, we have pretty tight funding things going on with services and that directs a lot of what we do. So we have to figure out ways to shift that, I think, to make are even our funding streams, but also even our healthcare system be more proactive rather than reactive. You know, we wait until someone's heart is ready to like, well, we wait until you have a heart attack to work on Mm -hmm. good nutrition. It's, it's the same idea. I think. What would you say if you, if you had, I don't want to say, usually I do it's a magic wand question, but in this case, let's say that there's an insanely wealthy parent insanely wealthy couple. And they say, my child was just born. I, I love this prevention idea. I want you to make the best nurturing environment. I want you to do all the things you, you, you put forth in your paper and your talk. What would that look like 
kind of best case scenario in terms of, you know, the promoting those big four? Like what would be some of the key steps? Well, I have an answer, although I'm trying not to get hung up on the insanely wealthy part because that would bother me. <laughs> well, more in terms of you don't have to worry about the funding I don't source. I that's I'm even going to yeah. I'm play to into move. the answer. Yeah. No, no, no. It <laughs> the should, money well, piece. It's more just that you yeah. don't have to worry yeah. about insurance isn't going to pay for this. your consulting fee is quite high. Is that what I'm hearing? I mean, I want to make as much as I can get before. You know, that's that's where my joy comes from. No, I'm kidding. Uh, Actually, but more just you don't have to worry about any of the sort of logistics of you know, okay. public health is going to pay for this and, you know, well, insurance will pay for this. Yeah. So, so let me, let me throw this out. First of all, I would wish for a world where there weren't such disparities between children and the access they get. Cause I actually do think that is part of the joy problem mm-hmm. is, is that there are such disparities and a lot of things that there's too direct of a relationship between what's done and the money. And I think that is joy sucking. I I think that the relationship shouldn't be so close to the money. I mean, you need money. Like, it's not going to work if you don't. But I think that it shouldn't be such a close correspondence between what we do and access to the money. And if I were thinking about all the wonderful variables, and we talk about this a lot in the book, actually, because we're trying to give parents kind of our grandmother wisdom, um, for those of you who can't see me, I'm old, I'm 60, (laughs) but we're trying to give our grandmother wisdom. And in the book, it's me who's been a practitioner for these years and for almost 35 years. And Peggy, who has been the parent of, he's now a young man with autism, but she's also a journalist and she's covered a lot of different things. So we actually spent 10 years writing the book. We did a lot of other things. We were raising children, taking care of parents, all of that. But but we thought about this. We thought, well, what are the wonderful conditions that could produce really sustainable and meaningful and joyful progress for a child and their family over time. And I think part of it is resources, whether you choose to do, you know, one-on-one at home or in a center or an inclusive setting, in all places, there needs to be enough, you know, Everyone needs to have access to food and shelter and and the staffing ratios have to be decent enough for things to happen and people need to not be very stressed. So there are context things like that. I think the other thing is that the people that are helping put together things, you know, the, the behavior analyst, the social worker, the early childhood educator, the parent, all have to have the space to work together. Like there needs to be time and energy and desire and motivation to do that. And from the behavior analyst point of view, we kind of break down like thinking about it like a master chef. You need to know about chemistry. As behavior analysts, we need to know about the principles of behavior and how it generally works. And you need some basic good recipes. As a behavior analyst, same way, we need some basic treatment programs. And I think the big four are the basic intervention programs or teaching programs. So you need good ways to teach those things to very young children. And then you need an environment that will appreciate all of that and help move it forward. So, and I think for me, and this may be just how I was trained, but it's been really important for me to be in settings where there are typical children. Even having my own children and grandchild has been important because I see like the kinds of things you should help kids learn to talk about. And also the range of how children are. Like some of them really do spend a lot of time on one thing and are really very interested in it. So that's not like a horrible thing that sometimes people are very afraid of that children with autism do. So I think, I think it's also being able to take the approach of expanding rather than contracting a child in a family's world that All of the programs and all of the teams should be working on expanding and not contracting, not stopping, but but opening up new possibilities. So I think I would focus more on all of that is called the community of practice. I would focus more on on building a community around the child that there are various disciplines and people who are responsive in different ways. Like as a behavior analyst, I would be responsive to meaningful and sustained progress and increasing complexity of the responses the child was making. And I would 
be paying attention to the contingencies. That's like what we do. So I would be doing those things where, you know, somebody else, if the child really loved music, maybe a music teacher would be in there and teaching them to play Chopin if that's what they loved, you know, but there would be people who would work together in the community towards the child's well-being. Like that would be the best of all worlds, I think. And that the child, which is probably the next thing, is that they would also be working on the child developing their own agency in the world. Mm -hmm. The child could start saying, this is what I want things to look like, or this is how I want to spend my time, or I don't care for that style of teaching, thank you. Whatever it is that, that they're which is where the big four starts and where it should end up is that 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 beautiful soul has some a lot of autonomy in terms of progressing themselves in their own communities. And when you say that that sort of autonomy on on progressing kind of one's oneself is is that sort of are you referring to sort of the idea of like the the coping skills? Because I, I know in the in in the original paper, you know, we, you, you have the sections of like gaining attention, and that feels very much like oh, it's kind of like you know, I'm requesting attention appropriately, you know, <laughs> in, in addition to you know a lot more yeah. to it than that, but yeah, at its core, kind of, and communication, like I can ask for the things I want, and then engaging in play, yeah. I have lots of things I want, and then when you get to the coping skills and the idea of being flexible, you do note that in the papers, like this is probably the hardest. This might be the hardest one to to teach to get people to move outside of that comfort zone. You mentioned that possibly focusing on the other three forms of communication might lead to just a lot of coping skills sort of developing on their own. But I mean, am I oversimplifying it when I sort of hear kind of what 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 you're saying, or am I completely missing the point of like if all of these are in place, we set up the individual for wanting to explore, wanting to move outside of just the known and the few things that they have at hand and wanting to engage in in more of their environment to try new things, to to be brave, to to find joy in the new? I mean or or am I just going too far in one direction or the other? No, no, no. I I, I think you've you've got it. Well first of all I think this idea is so in its infancy, you know, even our functional analyses are so in its infancy, but the idea of, okay, so we've got, let's figure out how not to do those things. That's number one. And number two is, okay, you're not doing those things. How can we build the complexity of those things? So you end up being a human who can navigate your own environment in the ways that you want it to be navigated. And, that you will have good relationships in your communities. And it may be, you know, like I personally choose to spend a lot of time doing behavior analysis (laughs) or doing my art. So like I have maybe three activities, my family, behavior analysis and art, you know, maybe a couple more, but so I may choose not to have 15 things that I do, but that has been a process over my lifetime. So I think the goal is as much as possible that that the people that we're working with, our goal should be that they can start to navigate that themselves or with the help of whoever they want to help them. That also gets more complicated in terms of the cultural aspects also because you know there are more individualistic cultures and more collective cultures so to a certain extent I don't really make all my decisions by myself because I I come from a more collectivist culture so I will call and you know ask three family members what do you think of this and we'll consult on it and I'll get their input and then there'll be a decision so it's not I'm just going to do this because I want to so so that also will vary depending on the individual's context and, you know, where where and how their family is situated. But the idea is for all of us, like even I'm sure you all experienced in the pandemic, like the conditions change so much. Like I have had to awkwardly learn new ways to communicate with people and to communicate with people who are really stressed. Like I watch my kids making school transitions. I watched my grandchild making school transitions. I watched all the youth that I work with and young adults. Like there's been a lot of stress in different ways. People have died around them. You know, they've lost jobs, all kinds of things. So we've all had to learn new ways of 
doing most of the big four, actually. But we had learned to learn. And we're learning, like even doing this, like I love the idea of the podcast, because it's learning to talk about different things in new ways. And that's a really important thing, I think. So this is actually what we're doing right now, I think is one of the big four, or several of them, probably. But it's it's us developing the complexity of our skills in those areas. But I don't think we have a technology of that. Nothing even close to it. <laughs> I'm, I'm really glad we, you know, you brought in the, the culture aspect too, because I think we as behavior analysts need to do that a lot more, right? And look at the context and where, and where our clients are and what, you know, what their lives are like so that then we can give them the best suggestions, right? So when parents will be like, what should we do, right? I don't know what to do. If we don't have any knowledge about the context in which the family is coming from, we might give suggestions, right, that will be maybe counterintuitive for the culture. So I'm, I'm just glad that we're, we're talking about the importance that culture plays in the big four in, in cultivating joy. It's a really big one. And it's one we have so much to learn, all of us. I I think it's, it's, we actually, we just wrote a chapter for the handbook on applied behavior analysis and autism. And the title of the chapter is Be Humble, Care and Learn. Because I think there's so much humility. And Patricia Wright has written about this in beautiful ways. And Nisia Ulessi Circioni has also written and spoken about this. There are two people definitely to, to watch. But I think that I don't think we even understand the depth of, <laughs> of what we need to understand yet. Mm-hmm. But I do think one thing I hope that we will work towards is within our funding streams and billing structures, I would hope that we can work towards having more in-depth time with families to understand more of the cultural context. Because I also think it's not a kind of one and done thing, like no assessment really is. But I also think people are in the process of learning how to understand their own cultural context and communicate about it. And, And that takes time. And then to understand somebody else's and to communicate your own, that takes more time. So I think there are things there, and the more different we are from the families that, that we're working with, the more time we'll probably need to figure those things out. But I think, like, I'm so happy to see what's been happening in our field. Like, our journals have all had special issues. There's a lot more training. There are companies that even specifically help in this area, which is really, really good. You know, we're talking about sort of trying to combine a lot of the technologies we have to create sort of a, a newer technology. So, you know, the individual parts might have the research, but sort of this idea that we're discussing is is, is still not actually theoretical, but it's not like, here's the joy plan that we've been putting in place. And we have lots of research on that. We've really talked about it in terms of that early intervention the, with working with young children, because you know, it's hard to be preventative with an adult to some extent, you know, <laughs> I guess we can to some extent. But do you see this idea of you know, joyful interaction, maybe even using some of the the the, the dance acronym, the idea of you know designing and arranging, being in the now, contemplating, enjoying those interactions. Is that something that you would like to see expanding beyond just this is something you do with little kids and once you're four or five, like you're not little anymore. Sorry, it's back to the real world and the grind and we're just going to talk about our basic contingencies and learning from our, you know, aversive situations. Am I jumping the gun on even asking that question though? I mean, no, no. I think well, so we have this dance training that we do with toddlers and parents and and dance is both a metaphor and an acronym and basically it's a just a nice way to work on a relationship and to have back and forth mutual reinforcement, but also to teach parents about how the three-term contingency works in that relationship. So I, I think the, the, the goals of joy, the big four and the dance, I think all of those are probably important for all of us in some way. I mean, whether you call them all, you know, the dance or the big four or whatever, but I think I think for all of us, like I think about my typically developing kids, 
you know, I would like their schools to work on the big four. I think those are good life skills for everybody. Yeah. In fact, Greg Hanley and his colleagues, I think Tony Camilleri and Anar In- Ingerson, they actually for a while had a preschool where they looked at some version of that as just good life skills that they were teaching the preschoolers. So I think that I think they're just generally good things for children to learn in their learning you know, their educational environments, whether they have a a label of a disability or not. And I also think that in general, and this is something I got from Head Start and from, you know, what I learned from Project 12 Ways is that it's just really nice for parents and children to learn good ways to respond to one another that help their relationships grow in healthy ways. And, And so I think I'd like to see that like prevention for all in those ways that, you know, and in some places like in, I don't know if they still do this, but like in Australia, they have these beautiful parenting programs that just start out for everyone. So it would be nice if we, if we just had it in general for everyone. And then it got more tailored depending on, you know, if, if the family or the child or the community had more needs, then there would be more refinements. Would you say it's 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 never too late to try to create those joyful interactions, you know, at, with, oh. with your family, with your clients? Because I, I I always hate the idea of, you know, people. Have, I love talking about prevention because it feels so it feels like we said like liberating. And then people are like, well, what about everyone who's in their their forties and they're dealing with all these problems? And I never want to say like, no, no, too bad they missed my awesome program. Yeah. But you know, we're, I don't know. I I still find joy in my life, right? But when did you start? Did you start later on in life, or did you start earlier? I've always found joy, Rob. There's so much joy. But, but, you know, also, like, we have, a, you know, we have a teenager now, and, like, our relationship with him has definitely changed over time, and you have to, you know, find new ways to how, – how your relationship's going to grow and change over time, and the joy that's in there is going to look different at different points. Well, maybe it's a – maybe I'm asking the question wrong, because I, I think a lot of times, maybe it's just my perspective as the behavior analyst coming in, like, hi, I'm here to help the client, and the client's – in their twenties or they're 18 and you you sort of are doing the history. You're looking at at the past and you're sort of, you know, in the back of your mind, you're trying not to say this out loud, but you're sort of like, Oh, why didn't they do this 15, 16 years ago? Oh, if only this had happened so much longer ago. Yeah, no, no, I, I definitely hear what you're saying. And I think because I work, and always have worked with young children. I focus on that. But I have also worked with the older kids. And I'm also working in a counseling program with adults who have, well, youth who have very, very difficult circumstances. And sometimes I think, oh, my gosh, the same way as you. But you know what? I think that on one hand, it's it's always good to work for improving the system and starting as early as you can. That that's kind of a, a given. At the same time, life happens and all of us have different challenges in different ways. And I think as humans, we are happier and we feel more meaning in our life when we, whatever the conditions are, we say, How can this be better? How can we improve it? And I think you take the big four and I mean, if you look at most of the FA studies, like the treatment is usually functional communication. So, you know what? No matter what, whoever you're working with, chances are all of us need communication Mm -hmm. help. Mm -hmm. All of us need relationship help. All of us need and want skill complexity help with our leisure skills and what we like. And all of us want to learn to do the hard things in better ways, in easier ways. So I think no matter what it is, you can step in and say, okay, this is what we got. And this is where we can improve it, you know, which is a great thing about our field. I think in the the white book, you know, Cooper, Huron and Heward talk about this being a hopeful science. And I think part of the hopefulness of our science and practice is that at whatever point we walk into the show, we think, okay, this can be better. And hopefully we talk with everyone and say, how do you think it would be better? What would you want it to be? You know, that that's important. All of these are about providing agency to our clients yes. in varied yes. ways. And I, I used to do EI too. And, and I would say that to my, my teachers as well. I was like, why would I wait until there's a problem to teach them how to say that they're all done with something or to teach them how to ask for help or to teach them to you know point to what they want. Like these are going to be lifelong skills. 
independent of whether this is going to present later as a, you know some type of you know trigger response, right? Like we all need and learn how to do these types of things. So we should be yeah. teaching them from the get go. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, I, I, I know we're almost at the end of our time. So why don't we move into our last section of the show, the dissemination station. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Jake, Jake, you sounded a lot like that old Ferris Bueller song on that one. It was like, bop, bop. <laughs> Makes me want to Twix. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, I guess you know, uh, I changed it up. I changed it up. I'm in a new location, new location, new train, new life. <laughs> <laughs> so, Shala, in this section, we sort of try to focus on like what what's the big take home point, or what's the sort of actionable step. So, if someone's listening and they're like, "I don't know," or "I want to give it a try," you know, what's the? I don't want to say the lowest response effort step, <laughs> but sort of where where could they begin, or 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 what would they be thinking of in terms of taking your work and then sort of reflecting on it as part of their practice. So what advice would you have for the practitioner who says, I like this joy stuff, but now what? I think maybe forming a community of practice around it where you're looking at how you can understand what, what these things are, how you can measure them, because the truth is we get what we measure. And also a community of practice always implies that you're in the process of learning. I think our field is in the process of learning, but any group of people that want more joyful and also more contextually meaningful advances in their programs, I think it's going to be a learning process. And it's good to have a community who's doing that together. So I think that's one of the biggest things is have a community that intentionally gets together, thinks about this, reads you know, my articles, and, and there are a lot of other people writing about these things, but reads those things And then thinks about, well, where do we start? Like, what's one thing we can do? Like, we have one measure I talk about in the talk and in some of our later work, but this came out of the Kegel lab, Ty Vernon and Kegel had a measure of synchronous engagement, which I love because it's it's about either the therapist and the child or the parent and the child moving together in their engagement. So we use that. We call it the triad of care. We use that measure in addition to the teaching episodes that the parent or the child is engaging in, and then also counting the child's skill increases. So we look at those three things. So I think that's an easy place to start because you can kind of look out and see, well, if we look at the engagement of people in our care, you know, Do they look happy? Do they look like they're working together? Is there less downtime? Also measures of Michael Fabricio has talked about this, Kelly Ferris, Liz Lefebvre, about approach and ascent. So you can have some measures about ascent, like how much people choose to be in the setting. That tells you a lot about what's going on. So I think to look at all that research, look at Eileen Schwartz's work, Kelly's work about about quality of life and talk about, well, how can we incorporate some of those things in our measures? So I think it's like everything we do. I remember Don Bear used to talk about how we, people who work with kids with autism and produce these incredible changes, how we eat big problems for lunch. And I think that, I think this next phase in our evolution, like to, to expand the fullness of what mm-hmm. we what we bring and what we understand from a scientific point of view to expand that fullness is a big lunch. And so I think the best way to do that is to take a bite at a time, but to take it with your friends. So, so you have advice about how to do it together, how you can move beyond where we are right now so that we make even more meaningful change, but also valued by the people that we're working with. Oh, I love that. I know. That's great. great. (laughs) <laughs> so, Dr. Eli Rosales, thank you so much for for coming on the show tonight. If folks want to, you know, certainly, the, you know, we we will have links to the to the article and, and to the talk uh, slides on our website. But if folks, we, we probably will also have a link to the book. But if folks want to kind of get a little bit more of a, I don't know if it's more thorough necessarily, but the longer version that kind of encapsulates a lot of what we discussed. To tonight, the book is Between Now and Dreams, Responsible and Responsive Parenting and Autism. And that can be purchased at, Donna, you had it just a second ago. 
Um, it's different roads it's, to learning, but you can get it on Amazon too. Oh, okay. um, I think when a book is new, it says it's out of stock until people start ordering it. But right. we did like a test and you still get it right away. So, and I, I will note, because if you heard my finance thing or the resources, we, we priced it as low as we possibly could. And the publisher was awesome about that. So it would be more accessible. I love it because it's now available. So you can purchase it. So people must be buying it. Awesome. That's good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and, good. and folks, it, it, it is, Charles, not lying. It, it, the, it is one of those prices. I'm like, yeah, you know what? I think I'm going to pick that up right now. Mm-hmm. So we'll, we'll, we'll add that to the cart very soon. <laughs> Probably we get yeah. off there. And because Peggy is a journalist and because she did not have resources when she was doing a lot of her parenting, she relied on the library. And it turns out there's a very special way to get books in libraries. And we had to go through all of this. The publisher also did all of that work to make sure that it was available to people who don't have the money and could just go to the library. I love that. Yeah. Uh This is a great group that we worked with to from start to finish, they're, it's a really good organization. They're very supportive of families. That's uh, really awesome. Yeah. And, and, and if anyone out there wants to kind of get in touch to, you know, ask you questions about sort of joy or, you know, the, the big four, is there a place that you can be reached online or an email? Yeah. If you go to my UNT email, you just Google my name and it should mm-hmm. come up my UNT email. I'm actually pretty good about responding at least to say hey let's circle back in a month because things are crazy right now but that's a good way to get a hold of me i'm not i'm old so i'm kind of on facebook but i'm not like (laughs) i need someone to teach me how to like tweet and all of that but yeah email is probably the best way (laughs) i need that too so if somebody teaches you let me jump on (laughs) Yeah, we should get like a group on for someone to to teach better social media. <laughs> we'll, all, we'll all get in on this. I love that. <laughs> well, again, Dr. La- Rosales, thank you so much for being on the show. We really appreciate it. We want to say thank you once again to Dr. Shala Alai Rosales for coming on the show and talking about joy, talking about the big four. Again, this isn't a video podcast, but we all had a lot of good <laughs> laughs and smiling in talking about this topic. So I don't know about you, but I know one of the things that makes us keep coming back to the show is the joy we get out of doing it. And we want to thank all of you out there for helping us by, you know, continuing to listen and sending us such nice messages on the show. Hopefully you'll also be able to send some nice messages to Dr. Ali Rosales as well about this work. And and we hope you explore it yourselves. We'd really appreciate it if in your joy of podcasts or listening to people talk about behavior analysis that you subscribe to ABA Inside Track. Maybe leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you like to get those podcasts. You can also find these episodes posted on YouTube with the YouTube subtitling feature enabled. You can go to our website, abainsidetrack.com, to find links to all of the articles discussed on this episode, as well as links to all of our previous episodes and a place to purchase CEs as well as some other cool merchandise. Speaking of CEs, you probably want to get our second secret code word right now, and it is BEYOND, B-E-Y-O-N-D, BEYOND, sort of like going beyond what we think of as our regular treatment in some of the work that we discussed tonight, BEYOND. If you finished listening to this episode and you like even more ABA Inside Track content, we invite you to join us over on patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track, where you can get even more ABA Inside Track content. For just $5 a month, you can get all of these episodes a week ahead of time, as well as access to some of our special live Q&A videos, a chance to vote on a quarterly episode that we discuss, and then present live to our patrons. And if you say, you know what I'd love? Longer episodes, maybe about a book rather than an article. Well, hey, we got the thing for you. If you subscribe at the premium $10 level, you're able to get access to our quarterly book club podcast. We just recorded. So for patrons, this is already available. Our talk on the nurture effect by Anthony Biglin, where we talked for two hours all about preventative care on the global scale. So if you like this episode, you may like that discussion. And did I mention that all of our book club episodes on our Patreon feed come with two CEs at no additional charge? just to increase your potential interest. If that topic's not enough for you, we also have hours and hours of discussions on books such as Meaningful Differences, Neurotribes, and Nudge, the Behavioral Economics book, or uh, Dog Training on the other end of the leash. We've got a whole bunch of books that we have already discussed. And again, that's at patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track. You can always send us an email too at abainsidetrack at gmail.com. 
I want to also thank Dr. Jim Carr for recording our intro and outro music, Kyle Sturry for his interstitial music, and of course, to Dan Thabit of the Podcast Doctor for his amazing editing work. We'll be back next week with another fun-filled episode, but until then, keep responding. Bye!